All right, most, most people say I don't need a microphone, so, um, but we'll kind of get things going. My name is uh, Coach Joel Brazil, and um, I'm the varsity hockey coach and help out here with, uh, as, a, as an assistant with the track team as well. Um, Brian Parsons wanted to be here, but we are very shy on uh, people with the soccer game, so he's gonna come over here in a little bit and, and attend this, but he actually is running scoreboard now um, as our athletic director, so he'll hustle over here when the girls are done, which sounds like they're winning, which is awesome. So my, my role really is just to kind of be a facilitator of this. We have two keynote speakers, uh, Scott Pollock, who you will hear in just a moment, a little bit about Scott, and I've known him for probably the better part of six to eight years. Um, Scott's playing background, um, actually from hockey's based background, is with Bowling Green University, um, back when Jerry York, who is now the very renowned coach of Boston College, he played under Jerry. Um, then became an assistant coach under Jerry at Bowling Green and then at Boston College and then became a head coach at uh, Bowling Green State University. When um, USA Hockey began, it's what I would call its metamorphosis and, and what we call the American development model um, about eight years ago. Uh, we wanted to contact and reach out to specific key people regionally um, and we would put them in charge of a broad state area, multiple state area, of which Scott has, is it mid, mid, -am, mid am area, which is Ohio and Indiana and some points further, further south. And Scott's primary job is really to work with um, the hockey community about talking about long-term athlete development, about the benefits and the significant strengths of being a multiple sport athlete, which really ties in with what we want Scott to talk about. So this isn't a hockey discussion. It's really a discussion about one of the major culture changes we've made here at Granville in the past six years, um, which at the high school level, we now have a, a plethora of multiple sport, two and three sport athletes, which just a few years ago, four, five, six years ago, that was uncommon. When I took the hockey program over, we had one multiple sport athlete. Now every athlete on our team is a two to three sport athlete. Um, our football program is going the same direction, certainly a wrestling program and baseball. So Scott's gonna talk about the benefits of that and also about the, the development of youth athletes and where the primary focus should be. Um, then following that, we'll have Coach Esposito from the, the new Davenport football program, which will uh, have its inaugural season this year and then roll into the GLIAC the following year, which is one of the more difficult Division II programs, Division II conferences in the entire country. So he'll be here to speak and he'll kind of discuss um, youth athletic exposure, um, getting you know some notification, going to different camps and stuff that will help um, kind of get your player, your athlete out there, out there and some of the primary opportunities that will, will be there. So without uh, any further ado, we'll kind of get Scott going. Thanks, Joel. Hey, everybody, uh, yeah, thanks. I like that. Can anybody uh, hear me? Uh, am I good? Okay. Hey, uh, thanks, for Joel, for that, uh, that introduction, and uh, thanks for everybody for being here. Uh, I'm a little overwhelmed as far as the, uh, the facilities here. A lot of times I'm giving uh, development talks in locker rooms, uh, concession areas, lobbies of ice rinks, uh, parking lots, uh, a lot of different areas. So for this, uh, a little intimidating here, Joel, but this is outstanding. I, I, I got the tour beforehand, got here a little bit early, and I really can't believe uh, how nice this facility actually is. All uh, the grounds, the athletic facilities, the, the weight room, the, uh, the hallways, everything here is just uh, uh, first class. So Joel, thanks for uh, letting me do this. Uh, I am going to talk about uh, athlete development and specifically long-term athlete development and please feel free at any time. If something does not quite ring a bell, uh, feel free to ask a question. I'd love to, I'd much rather answer questions and get everyone's thoughts as opposed to just uh, lecture. I, I'm not a lecturer, and quite frankly, long-term athlete development has a lot of uh, human movement, human body, science to it, of which I don't know very much, okay? I'm a hockey coach, okay, I've been a coach for uh, most of my adult life. I've been in hockey for most of my adult life and very fortunate to do that. But what's been really cool now over the last seven years, we've been able to kind of parlay what we were doing as coaches in, in previous lives to now go back 
into kind of back to the future type of thing by taking, hey, our athletes, my whole life for basically 20 years was trying to figure out 18 to 24 year old athletes. Okay, wake up every day, hey, what happens for an 18 year old? How can I mold 18 year old players, 26, 18 to 24 year old hockey players into a team? How can they make them better athletes? How can they make them really teammates that'll come up for the common good? Okay, hey, now my life is different. Now it's about 8U hockey, 10U hockey, 12U, 14, 16, 18 and under hockey. I was really fortunate uh, last month, we had the second cycle of the Youth Olympic Games in Lillehammer, Norway. Okay, so I was asked to coach our U.S. team over in that tournament. Okay, two weeks with basically 17 2,000 birth athletes. Tremendous athletes. Okay, we had a subcommittee that had to pick those players. Very difficult thing to do to try to come up with around the country 17 athletes. Extremely difficult thing to do. Fortunately, players that were there, six of which were from the state of Michigan, outstanding players, outstanding young men, came home with the gold medal. Okay, really a great thing. But it was really neat for me to kind of step back a little bit and watch it and, and understand, hey, a year ago, these players were at the 14U level, okay? Now they're 15 years old, soon to be 16 year old athletes, right now excelling. But now the picture kind of paints a little bit in my mind because here I am talking about development all the time and I'm always thinking, hey, what's beyond? Because if we're gonna develop something, we're always looking to what is, what are we gonna develop to? So you take a snapshot. These were under 16 year old hockey players. 2,000 births. Hey, what's the next step? What do we see? What's gonna happen? And history tells us, okay, because we do a lot of festivals, do a lot of national teams. History will tell us that 50% of those players won't be at the national level as far as making a team the following year, okay? So it's an interesting thing. So you look and try to say, Wait, boy, these kids are all outstanding young athletes, outstanding young guys. So what's gonna happen now when they get to be 18, 20 years old? And that's really what we wanna talk about here today. Long-term athlete development, but you're gonna hear it more from a athlete slash coach perspective, okay? and really what we've been able to learn as development people for a governing body, what we've been able to learn about athlete development over the years. Hey, understand now, this is long-term athlete development, so one of the key words that comes into mind for athlete development, or any type of long-term development, is patience. So what we need is some patience. Hey, baby! Baby! Yeah! Hockey fans aren't like other fans. You own this nursery! Loser! Loser! Best baby in the world! Okay, one of my favorite commercials ever. All right, obviously I'm a hockey guy, okay? So, I love that commercial. But I also love it for what we talk about here. Because unfortunately, a lot of times, like that young man there, he's got his child, and automatically, hey! You're the best. You're it. Okay, now we exaggerated. That's a newborn. But we hear it all the time. Eight years old, 10 years old, 12, okay? But at the end of the day, that is youth sports. That is youth sports. And what we want out of youth sports a lot of times conflicts with what really we should have happening in terms of development, okay? We need a youth sports culture based on the proper experiences, kids enjoying what, they're in, what they should be doing, playing youth sports. And while that's happening, we should be able to put players in a proper environment. So what happens, as Joel said, USA Hockey 
eight years ago, we just finished our seventh season as development managers. Okay, we put in place a hockey American development model based on long-term athlete development principles, and we hockeyized it. Okay, so we've been out trying to preach these principles of development to our hockey community. But along the way, the USOC, okay, who is the governing body for all the governing bodies, they came along and said, you know what? We love these principles. We need all of our athletes across the country to have an idea what this is about. We need our coaches who are coaching our athletes to have an idea about the principles of long-term athlete development. So the USOC came along and they implemented an American athlete development model Okay, that's been now in place starting in 2015. The idea came in 2014. And they're now going to all the individual sports and trying to get these principles in play across our athletic culture. And what it does, quite simply, is it lets kids be kids. Age-appropriate training. What is right for an athlete? What is right for a young child put in play in a proper youth sports model, okay? What we should be doing, what we can be doing, every step of the way from the time we enter sports to the time we're now reaching early adulthood, what do we look like when we leave? So, the principles, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, okay? But what the emphasis of what the USOC was trying to accomplish, okay, is to create more opportunities for athletes, get a more universal approach to what we do, okay? Let them develop age appropriately, okay? Because what we forget along the way in youth athletics way too many times, and the biggest thing that hit me over the head, going from 18 to 24 year olds to 10 U and 12 U athletes, we think the training environment is exactly the same. Hey, you know what, Jerry York, as Joel mentioned, he's the winningest coach in college hockey history. Tremendous coach. Outstanding builder of young men. But if I was to take everything Jerry's doing with his Boston College team as he prepares to go to the Frozen Four in Tampa in a week and a half and apply that to a 10-year-old squirt team that we have in Bowling Green, Ohio, guess what? Not really good, okay? Because those 10U and 12U athletes, they're not 18 and 20 years old. They're not miniature college athletes. They're young kids. Their bodies are different. Cognitively, they're way different. And socially, things are obviously a lot different. So what this is trying to do, is say, let's make sure that we get age-appropriate training and really hammer home athleticism. Athleticism. More sports, more involvement, more movement, more skills, okay? That's what our approach and what the USOC's approach is. As we continue to do this, we educate and we get quality coaching, age appropriate quality coaching all along the way here, okay? so. Again, what they're trying to get is understanding, hey, where are you in that path, okay? Where are you as a coach? We understand now, the USOC, now they want to have hey, five different levels, five stages of development. Where are you? Okay, where are you coaching? Is it a young, hey, 10, 11-year-old athlete, eight years old, just discovering the sport, okay? trying to, hey, I want to try something new. I want some athleticism, okay? I want to have some fun. We have the approach, we move up. Hey, stage two, develop and challenge, 10, 13, 14 years old. Work on the skills of those games, become athletic, challenge yourself. You move up the ladder, you train, you compete. Hey, you're high school athletes now. I see high school athletes out here. You're learning to train, you're learning to compete as athletes, okay? And then we get to that, hey, now the highest level of our sport, and then the full circle goes around, 
You can't play anymore. You can't play anymore. So now with that knowledge base, we can give back in a sport for life environment. Really cool. So as I said before, hey, what is long-term athlete development? Well, a lot of people, a lot of really smart people who do this stuff for a living, took a long time to figure out how the body works, what we're able to see athletically at different ages, okay, how the body moves, how the body acts, and how does that relate to athleticism. So what we try to do with the athletic part of it, hey, training, a competition model, a recovery model, let's put it in place, age appropriately, across the board here, to focus on, again, not about becoming the best eight-year-old, but let's make sure athletically, as we get through and we're into early adulthood, now we have a chance to reach our full athletic potential. So a great thing that we have going on. Okay, now, the quick science piece of this, what we have, you can't, can you read those boxes out there, by the way? Does everyone see that? So what we have, what we call windows of trainability. Every step along the way, hey, what can a young athlete do? What can the human body accept? Okay, and what should we be working on as we move along through our chronological age? All right, so obviously what we know is that female athletes, females are going to develop a little bit earlier, the boys are going to reach their growth spurt, all right? But what we have along the way, we look here, nine years old, six, seven, eight, nine years old, what should be a focus for young athletes besides moving around? having fun, enjoying what they're doing, and developing a passion, again, for being a part of an athletic culture. A fun aspect, cool thing, all right? But what we also know is suppleness and speed one are wide open for both boys and girls, so what we should be doing is moving as much as possible, all right, and do it as quick as possible because the speed window is wide open. We'll hit speed two down the, down the road, and the reason why is because our bodies are going to grow. Our method of movement is going to be able to have more capacity because we're bigger. Now, you don't have to be really ingrained in sports science to understand that. So now we've got smaller people. Let's work smaller areas and let's get quicker. So we move, that's the athletic part of it. So why do you see smaller soccer fields, smaller bases, shorter bases in baseball, smaller areas to compete in? Because we want the kids to be quicker. Make sense? Make some sense there? Hey, but now the most important thing now is we're gonna move up the ladder. So, so important here. This window, again, wide open for boys and girls. What does that say right there? Somebody shout it out. Skills. Skills. And more skills. Coaches. Skills. Most of the time, most of the time, when we see the highest achievers in our sport is because of what? They're very... Skilled, our top athletes, they have a high component of skill, all right? But what we lose sight of along the way is our skill window is most wide open coming out of 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 to 13 years old. It's the most time that our body is receptive to skill acquisition, okay? the fundamental skill movements of our sports, okay? This, 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 
this catching. Well, I mean, you got 34 sports here, Joel, right? I don't think I can do all of them. All right, but that. What did you do right there? What was this one? Is that a sport? Help me out a little. Oh, catching. Football. Oh, wrestling. Yeah. Okay. All those things. Sorry about that. I didn't quite pick up on that. But hey, keep in mind, I love the audience participation. So if you got anything more for me, throw it at me. But that's the time right now. So parents, coaches, you look at this, bam. So when I take my child to a practice, and they're 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, I hope I'm seeing that. I hope I'm seeing that as part of their training. How important is that? We're going to get to it. But now, we enter Tully. Where's Tully? Is he here? He's not here? Okay. Because now what we see, okay, right around that 12, 13, girls, that's where they're going to hit their peak height velocity. The growth spurt, boys a little bit later. That'll vary a year and a half each way. Okay, we know that. That's why we don't worry so much about the age. We worry about biologically. Where's our body at? But we get there, and now you start seeing strength, stamina, speed too, because the body can pick up with it, more long-term aerobic speed. The body's growing. Hopefully we've got a great skill set, because we worked on them in multiple sports. Man, alive, I can see kids that run fast. They can catch, they can jump, they can shoot hoops. You know what? That makes a pretty good hockey player. Okay, hey, give me all those methods of athleticism. Give me athletic players at 17 years old. Give me athletes at 17, and we'll come up with a winning formula in a lot of sports. Okay, we're building athleticism. And now, hey, we get with Tully here, and we start doing a proper type of training to build our bodies, to build our bodies up athletically. And it's different at every age, okay? We're really big right now in trying to promote, in our sport, in hockey, a lot of off ice, six, seven, eight, nine years old. Fun, agility, balance, coordination, races, okay? Hopping, develop athleticism. We try to promote that. That's why if we can get people jumping around, bouncing around, climbing around, flying around through the year safely, those things are all good athletically. And there you see the path of long-term athlete development. But what it means, how many of you guys saw this floating around the uh, internet about a year ago? Football guys, you guys see that okay? That's fortunate, I moved back to Bowling Green. My neighbor for, the, for, for his last football season at Bowling Green was Coach Urban Meyer, all right? And what an impressive, and I apologize for the Michigan fans here, all right? I'll apologize. It's probably not the right thing to do is come into a high school in Michigan and talk about the Ohio State football coach. But I have to just, this is one impressive guy, and he was a really impressive neighbor. But this was something that popped up on the Internet and didn't surprise me at all. You see the number of multi-sport athletes. He had his first 47 recruits, 42 of a multi-sport. Hey, the other thing, so again, transferring back to hockey, every time we have a world, a national team that competes in the world championships, okay, in April, a lot of NHL players come out of the playoffs, they go to world championships. Every four years, our best players are on the Olympic team. We throw surveys at them about their multi-sport participation. Our last Olympic team, it was right around 16 and a half years old, was the average on when players started moving to one sport, okay? So 16, 17 years old is when they went and participated and played hockey only. And we have so many outstanding dual sport athletes in our, in, in our sport at the highest level, all right? And here, one of the top football programs in the country, again, sorry for the caveat, I happen to be an Ohio guy now, I'm not trying to pick a fight, but 42 of the first 47 recruits 
for Urban Meyer were multi-sport athletes in high school. Okay, right here, my wrestler. How old is this young man? 12? 14? 12, 14, 17? This guy's 16. Okay. Twelve, correct? Fourteen, sixteen? All right. Obviously, you know what I'm going to say here. All those athletes are 14 years old. Okay. They're all our national camp. We used to have a national camp at 14 years old. We eliminated the 14-year-old national camp, moved it to uh, a district camp. And now we start our first level national camp is at 15. Come out of your district, go to national camp. Those were all 14 years. That's one of the reasons why we made that move. Now, it's not going to change dramatically at 15, but it certainly woke us up because a lot of mistakes get made right here. All right? A lot of mistakes. We label players. We label athletes. Big kid must not move very fast. Okay, small kid, he's probably skilled, but he can't play the game hard. We label players, and we make so many mistakes with this. Okay, because the reality is, hey, some of these kids, he definitely has gone through peak height velocity. He's reached his growth spurt, correct? This little fella probably hasn't. And you have a conversation with him, you can certainly tell. All right? So what we know is that all these kids, we need to make sure we pay attention to the individual athlete. Because we can't lump them together. We can't say, hey, this guy's probably going to be a little bit more effective right now. But we don't know a year from now, three years from now, five years from now. And again, that's a basis of what we try to figure out. And we try to put programming in and continue to educate parents, coaches. And they say, we don't, what's happening at nine years old or ten years old is a snapshot in time at nine or 10. Enjoy that time. Enjoy it. Enjoy it for the fun. Enjoy it for the youth sports experience you have. It means nothing as far as 18 years old. Because we just can't tell that. All right? And why is that? Because so many times we base things, our structure a lot of times, as I mentioned before, goes away from development. Why is that? Because at nine years old, 10 years old, a lot of times, we're more concerned about winning a nine or 10 year old game than we are with kids getting the proper experience. Okay? Now, my guys in that row, you've been really good to me so far. Nine, 10, 11, 12 years old, what did I say was really important for athlete development? Skills, right? Your practice is really skilled when you're 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, correct? Or were you in a basketball environment, and we're going to get a little video to talk about this, were you in a basketball environment where the coach took you away from the ball? Big guy, go stand underneath the basket. I don't want you touching the ball. Okay? Unless we give it to you underneath the basket. All right? Hold that thought because we're going to come back to that in a little bit. I want to know about your basketball environment. But again, a lot of times we lose sight of what's important at that age. We base things on the outcomes. We base things on some outside parameters. People aren't really that concerned about what's right for the kids. A little bit more about what's right for the adult level, OK? And we lose sight sometimes of long-term athlete development and the facts of how the human body works. So along the way, how am I doing for time, Joel, by the way? Am I OK? Awesome. Awesome. Hey, I, I love the chart, and I tell you what, I, I love talking about this kind of stuff. This here happens to be a project of mine I had to put together 
people are asking, okay, so again, I was, I'm fortunate from the, I, I've been able to be around a sport I love for a long time, all right, and I had the, uh, the coaching part of it for a long time. It was awesome. This part now is really incredible what we do. So, and I have, my, my family consists of, my wife and I, we, we have a 21-year-old, okay, uh, in college, a 17-year-old daughter, and another 14-year-old boy. So we were just about getting through the youth sports part of her, and it was twilight of the youth sports. So people ask, hey, if you had to do this all over again with your child, with your kids, with your athletes, what would you do? What would you look for? Okay, so that's kind of cool. I had a little project I did. So I came up with a little bit of a uh, youth sports priorities. All right? So again, guys, in this row here, based on what I was talking about, this is what I would be looking for no matter where I'm going. And again, this is the development side of it. The first thing I'm making sure is that the coaches are promoting an atmosphere of fun. They're promoting an atmosphere of passion for youth participation and that sport, and a passion for being an athlete, okay, i.e. fun. On top of that, hey, are we developing athleticism on the court, off the court? on the field, off the field, on the ice, off the ice. Is that part of the training? Is that part of the re regimen? Is that part of the whole curriculum of what we do? Are we moving? Are we developing athletes? Is there an off-ice piece, an off-court piece that promotes agility, balance, coordination, and fun? Okay, is that there? And then on the ice, on the court, are we moving? Am I getting quicker? All right, am I becoming an athlete? First thing, that's what I'm looking for. Next thing, guys, remember this one? Skills, okay. What's the training look like? If I'm choosing soccer, do we have a ball in our foot a lot? Okay, are we doing different things with the skills of the sport? Okay. Am I in an environment in baseball where I have this movement down and down? Or when I show up for practice, do I see the kids standing and waiting and waiting and waiting, waiting for a ball to come their way? What is that coaching environment that's happening? Does it promote the skills? and the movement in that sport. And then lastly, and in my mind, the most important piece, the sport specific compete and the sport specific problem solving. And this, folks, is why I think things really get kind of crazy in youth sports. And we go back to hey, focusing on the outcome of what we do. And we don't let players learn how to problem solve in the sport. We robotize our players. You go stand there. And you go stand there. And then go over here. Okay? Now the game starts. So the ball may be over there, but coach told me to go stand over here. So I really have no idea how to play. Okay? Soccer, I'm over here, the ball is over here. I'm not supporting the ball, I'm not defending the ball, I'm not getting open for a pass, okay? I'm looking at a chalkboard, coach told me to stand here. And we need to have a environment that lets players go for balls, battle for it, battle for it, battle for it, win it, and now what? What do I do with it? Score. That's a great thought. Okay? But probably what we need to do is I'm going to have someone coming at me. I just won the ball. Someone's coming at me. What do I do? Hopefully, 
I know where other people are. And I also learn at some point, if I don't have it, I should go somewhere where I can get it. And you develop sport IQ. You develop an understanding of how the sport works and not where to go stand. And that's how we get to coaching in an environment that allows for creativity and allows for players to learn their sport and become sports savvy. How many times you heard uh, basketball smarts, basketball sense, hockey IQ, hockey smarts, all right? Great ways to describe a player, but it doesn't happen by accident. It comes when players are allowed to learn how the game is operate and learn, figure out how to be successful in that, okay? So we just look real quickly, parents, all right? And I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm really rambling here, but I appreciate the opportunity. We see things we can do as parents, the role, hey, be in a position to understand the things I just talked about. Where is your child? How old is your child? What are they gonna get? What is the role? What's happening in practice? Are we training a lot? Or are we just going out and playing games? Are we learning the things we should be learning? Okay, and you have that responsibility to help your child move through and find the environments that have put them in a successful situation. All right, and obviously as we get older, the responsibility is gonna for, fall more on the athletes and the parents' role will slowly diminish in how this all comes to play. Baseball players. You know, it's almost taboo in baseball when a pitcher calls for a pop-up. But I mean, come on. This is Wainwright's ball. Molina's got too far to go with the ball. The ball didn't have enough hang time for Adams or Freeze to come in and make the play. They were playing too deep. So Wainwright is the so, guy who should make the call, but pitchers never make Any the Cardinal play. fans? Any baseball fans? Adam Wainwright, pretty good. Yadier Molina, is he one of the best catchers in the game? Well, why didn't they catch the ball? Because they're no good? So I wonder what Adam Wainwright's, what his parents were thinking when he dropped that ball in the World Series against the Red Sox, okay? And parents, you know where I'm going with this, it's okay, all right? I have, I'd probably do the same thing. My, my child, he's looking, looking, ball drops. And what is our reaction? All right. Our reaction is, hey, you know what? It happens. It happens at the highest level. They're going to do it. That's a World Series. Red Sox win the World Series, which was okay because I'm a Red Sox fan. It also makes a pretty good video for what we're talking about here. Coaches, how many coaches we got out here? All right, and as we delve back in and talk about a, the younger players here, the understanding what level you're coaching, where you're at, who you're coaching, knowing the environment, knowing along, hey, follow that graph, hey, what is the window of training? What should I be focusing on when I'm teaching? Okay, what is really important? And am I doing it in a fun, engaging, challenging role? Am I promoting? kids playing other sports, kids becoming more athletic. So are all things that really become the role. If we're gonna have quality coaching at all levels, coaches understanding what it takes to be an elite coach. This word is thrown around in youth sports more than any. Go to a soccer tournament with my daughter, she's 17. No matter where we go, in any type of game, tournament, showcase, whatever they're called now, how many times do you see a team called so-and-so elite? See it a lot? How about so-and-so premier? We see it all the time, which always makes me wonder a little bit. 
If you go to a tournament and a third of the teams are elite, what does that really mean for the word elite? It means being a top 33%. But it gets you thinking a little bit. But as a coach, we get thrown at this a lot. There's a lot of it thrown out in the youth sports vernacular. What does it take to be an elite coach? Here's our answer. Be elite at whatever level you're coaching. We have world-class 10U coaches in our sport. World-leading coaches coaching the squirt level, the might level, 8U, 10U, because they pay attention to what's important at that age group, and they nail it. And they put kids in the right environment, and they do what they're supposed to do as far as, I got squirts, heavy dose of skills, fun skills, puck compete, battle for pucks, win pucks, make a play. Go get it, battle, win it, make a play, have fun. All the fun things. Basketball, soccer, those are the things that makes the coaches the elite of what they do. My favorite video for youth coaching responsibility, right here. You're important in a lot of ways. First Pistons of all, coach. From a basketball sense, for just their skill development and stuff, that's going to start at a very young age, and it's going to be determined at a very young age. And quite frankly, you know, if you look around, we're, we're failing pretty badly in this country as a whole in teaching people basketball skills. And you all notice it that watch the NBA because there's a huge difference in just the skill level of the players coming from Europe and what we have here in terms of their ability to pass the ball and shoot the ball. We can't even produce enough people who can do those things here that we got to go across and try to find people who can do them. We're not developing skills here. One of the reasons is Okay, we are much more interested in playing games and winning and losing at a young, young, young age than we are in skill development. So I would say this to all of the youth coaches here, even more than the high school coaches, is you have to make a decision if you want to teach the kids that you're coaching how to play basketball or if you just want to win games because there's a big difference. I last spring coached both my 12-year-old daughter and my 9-year-old son for two months in a YMCA league and had a, had a group of kids. And I got to see every approach, okay? And I would say to you, of the probably 18 teams that I saw just in that limited time, there were maybe two or three coaches that were really trying to teach skills, and everybody else was just trying to win a game. Leave your best players on the court as long as you can. Play zone defense, for God's sakes. I, I, it was beyond me. In a nine-year-old league, play zone defense, okay, for the entire game. Obviously, don't ever let your biggest kids dribble the ball. Make sure they always give it to a guard, who is usually your son, okay, and so they can run up the court. And then you wonder why at the high school level we got so many kids who can't play and we never have a 6'5", 6'6", 6'8", kid who can dribble, pass, and shoot because at the young age you tell him to go stand under the basket and get the rebound and give it to somebody else. So the first thing I would say to you, you have a decision to make. Do you want to help build basketball players or do you want to just tell everybody you won your youth league? I love it, okay? I love it because it transforms. Okay, it goes into all sports here. Remember what I was talking to you guys about? Hey, if you're not going to be put in a situation to battle for balls, pucks, if you're not going to be put in that position to battle and make a decision, Battle, make a decision, dribble, skate, puck handle. Then how are you going to be that player down the road? How do you have an opportunity? How do you understand how the game operates? Go stand here. The most important thing we have in a basketball game is the basketball. We want you to go stay away from it. 
A puck's pretty important in a hockey game. You have to go battle for it. You have to win pucks. You have to make plays. You've got to learn how to do those things. Coaches, that's the environment that players need to be in. We can put everybody back. We can put players away to help us with that outcome of the game. But the reality is no one's developing. And what happens along the path, basketball players who can't dribble and aren't comfortable dribbling or going up for a rebound and winning, winning a rebound will generally be out of the sport because they no longer have any fun because they can't handle a basketball. You can't stick handle a puck, you can't handle a pass as you get to be 12, 13 years old, sport's not a lot of fun. The one player who was able to dribble, a lot of times the coach's son, as Stan said there, that guy has a chance. That girl has a chance. She's dribbling the ball. She's making decisions. That's one of five, or six or seven. So what have we done along the way? We're eliminating people having the opportunity to develop long-term athletically, okay? So coaches, really important we understand this. We're part of the process. Okay, our responsibility, I've always said, hey, my thing, is a child better in March than they were in September, as far as the hockey season? As a coach, every one of your athletes better at the end of the season when they started. That's what we try to take in, in youth athlete development, and understand the responsibility of a coach. Hey, not about at eight years old, 26 and four, four and 26, here are the athletes getting better. They do the things necessary at that age group to love the game and to improve. Understanding the end result is a long, long way down the road, okay? So we have a big slogan we use, Mike Boyle, Okay, he's been in Boston University, he went to Boston Red Sox, he's with our women's national team. One of his big phrases for development, okay. Tully here, when Tully's not here yet, you can't speed farm in development. You don't show up and say, hey, great workout today, I'm all done. Patience involved in development, patience involved as a parent, as a coach, and understanding the end product is down the road. Okay, I'm just gonna leave one, uh, one last thought here. Okay, a mantra that I've always tried to hold again, going from the, the, the college level to where now every time I step on the ice with teams, okay, or teams that actually happen to coach in BG, I try to tell myself all the time when putting something together, have a little mantra for what, what, what we do with development. And this is kind of what we call, if someone asked us this at a seminar at the World Championships, you have something for your team in your country. What do you do with your team? Put something together in 10 words or less that will kind of tell who you are as a coach. That's what I had together there, okay? Build the skills and the confidence and let them play. Sounds simple, but ultimately, we are all coaches, we are all athletes. We enjoy it. And if we can build the skills, and we can make people confident with the skills of the game, and then let them play. What a great thing we have for youth sports, and ultimately, a great plan for long-term development for our athletes. So. I really appreciate the opportunity to be in this auditorium, uh, talking to everybody. Any questions? I gotta have, I, I'm not leaving until I get a question from the, at least that group right there, but I'll take questions from anybody. Okay, we got, uh, what do we got there? Anybody? I want something. Can't leave. Question? Anybody? They'll think of one. Anybody else got some type of question? 
based on anything you saw? Yes. What do you got? Come on. Uh, right now, I work for USA Hockey. I'm on the development side. I just had the uh, our youth Olympic team, okay, uh, and the uh, youth Winter Olympics in Lillehammer, Norway, was my last coaching opportunity. Uh, outstanding group of young guys. So really cool. Good question. What sport do you play? All right. Cool. How long do you play football? All right. How long you wrestled? Why don't you play hockey? It's not too late. It's not too late. Anybody else? Well, once again, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. Joel, thanks for letting me do this. This is great. And uh, thank you.